Well, good morning again. I hope everybody's doing well, and hopefully you've uh, enjoyed being a part of what God's doing right now. You know, I, I was thinking about uh, this series as we were kicking it off last week, and I kind of trying to internalize a little bit and ask myself uh, the question. And, and really, there have been very few times in my life where I can remember where, that I have actually had real honest doubts about God. I don't know if you've been there, if you've ever really thought about it. Um, maybe not in the moment that you're trying to, maybe you've journaled it. Maybe maybe you've written it down, written it down somewhere to where you can remind yourself what that was like and, and who God was in those moments. But there have been very few times. I, there was a, a couple times, actually, when, when I was uh, just becoming a teenager. Um, it was one of those moments in my life where I had a natural question, a natural I doubt about God whenever I lost my dad. I, maybe you've been in a situation like that, and you just wonder, where are you, God, right now? Where are you? And actually, just a couple weeks ago, uh, I had one of these moments. And, you know, it's probably not something that's popular to share with a, a leader of a church sharing this, but there was a couple weeks ago uh, where it just kind of, I, I was stopped in my tracks and just said, God, the whole church has been praying about this thing. I don't get it. I don't understand it. What, what is your plan here? Um, and I was really questioning uh, what, what he was up to, not just in a, my friend's life, uh, but in the life of this church and my life, what, what that meant for uh, a lot of people around here. And I don't know if you've had that question. I, I don't know if you've ever really stopped Sometimes there's a struggle there. There was a wrestle that I wasn't really sure how to deal with at all. And, and I think that's exactly where God wants us. I think that's what we talked about last week. That's where God wants us. And, you know, I, this, I was very much in a, I believe, help me overcome my weak faith type of moment, right? I, I, that's, that's where I was. I don't know if you've been there before, but I, I want to encourage you um, to understand that that is a reality in most of our lives. Uh, that there's a reason that the Bible includes these accounts in history about people who dealt with these things, with Jesus, uh, very real moments that matter in our lives for us to see. So I, I want you to say this. I, I, want, I want you to hear this. I am glad to be part of a church that understands that that is a reality, that we don't have to be perfect, uh, that there are going to be struggles. Uh, you and I, both, all of us are going to have those struggles and those questions about where God is. I believe, help me overcome my unbelief. That, that's really what, the way we started this series last week. And if you haven't seen or, or caught up with this, I do want to encourage you always, we're, we're keeping an account of all the, the past message series and I uh, encourage you to go onto YouTube and find these. So um, today uh, we're going to deal with another one of these moments. These, this doesn't make sense. Help me understand this. Are you really who you say you are God type moments? And it comes from Matthew chapter 11. So if you want to get there ahead of time, go ahead. I want to encourage you to get there. This is a, a one of these situations. And we're going to be looking at this passage in a few moments. But this series is all about what do we do when we doubt? Uh, where, where do we put our faith? How do we struggle with it? What, what's going on? What is a perspective that we need to see from Jesus rather than just the worldly perspective that I have that I can be good at? Uh, but it would be better to have a better perspective of what Jesus has, what God has for my life. Last week, looking at this guy who honestly acknowledged his doubt and said, I want to believe. I want to. This is what I'm here for, Jesus. Help me overcome this weak faith that I have. Uh, you know, but here's what I, thought, what I love about that. Despite those doubts, uh, despite the weak faith, we still see the faith in those moments. There's a couple of things that just pop up and are clear to me. He had enough faith to keep trying to bring his son uh, and, and keep trying new things for his son. You, you have this son who was possessed by some kind of unclean spirit. This guy keeps trying, keeps trying, and he goes to all different angles, right? Uh, another thing that we see his faith, he had enough faith to approach Jesus in the first place. Some of us, it took a long time for us to get to that step. To say, all right, I've tried things my way, now I'm going to try things your way. Uh, this guy had enough faith to do that. He also had enough faith to risk failure in front of a crowd. And again, that's something that m not many of us want to chance. 
We don't want to get up in front of people and say, uh, or be laughed at, be, be scoffed at, whatever it is. And Jesus didn't do that, didn't laugh at him, didn't scoff at him. Uh, the crowd may have, but this guy had the faith to do it. And he just said, help me overcome this. The, there, there's all kinds of doubts that we could have. And, but doubts don't disqualify our faith. Doubts can sometimes magnify our faith. And we need to be able to see that this is a good thing that that we're going up on on these steps toward God that maybe we've never really tried before. Uh, But when some of us doubt, we feel guilty. Um, I I caught myself in that moment a couple weeks ago. There was some guilt. Why am I asking this question? Why am I questioning God in this way? Uh, But again, I think God wants us to draw near to him. And the fact that we're asking these questions of him in the first place is exactly where he wants us to be. So we need to turn the doubt, the, turn the guilt away and allow the doubt to build us up. The truth is, if you doubt, you're in good company. We see it throughout the Bible. The disciples doubted, namely a guy named Thomas. And you guys have heard of this guy. Uh, we talk about even the mother of Jesus doubted. Uh, that, that blows my mind sometimes whenever you think about it in that way. There was also that demoniac son that we just talked about last week. He doubted. So doubt is normal. You may, think about where you might be right now. You may doubt God's existence. I, I'm, I'm going to doubt m- most of you in here are right there right now. But if you are, kudos for showing up and continuing to listen and continuing to seek out the word of God. Uh, you may do that. God, if you're there, prove it. Show it to me. Because I've looked for you and I'm just not feeling it. Maybe that's where you've been. Maybe you've been into the point where you're just doubting God's goodness. You understand that he's there, but you may not understand his goodness and his desire to be good in our lives. And you're questioning, if you're good, why is this happening to me? Uh, Maybe that's where you sit today. Because that might be where many of us are. But you may altogether, again, see God there, see that maybe he's good, but you're just doubting his involvement that he just doesn't care about whatever happens, happens. And, and he's still sovereign. Yeah, we can call him sovereign. We can call him in control. But whatever happens, happens. And you might doubt his involvement just a bit. If you're so powerful, God, why don't you do something about it, right? So that's kind of where this doubt uh, path can lead us sometimes, down these questions. Uh, these avenues can take us, hopefully, ultimately leading us back to a relationship with Jesus and putting our trust in him. Think about where you may be with these different kinds of doubts. I, we can kind of identify doubts in three ways. One of them, there's, there's an intellectual doubt. Um, and that would be much like uh, what this guy uh, was <laughs> try, trying to find some evidence uh, when you talk about Thomas, right? Thomas was a guy that's like, hey, this doesn't make a lot of sense. People don't raise, they're not risen from the dead. That, that's like an intellectual uh, doubt. Like, this doesn't match up. What do you mean they crossed over a, a riverbed that was completely dry? That, there might be some doubts there. That's like an intellectual thing. That you might have an emotional doubt. And that emotional doubt is, is something that may, maybe you just see Christians as like hypocrites, uh, leaders, as, as people who have failed you. And there's an emotional attachment there. So it's, it's holding you back from a pure, uh, uh, you know, un, unashamed faith uh, because of what someone else has done to you. Uh, like, uh, again, maybe it's been a leader. Maybe it's been a brother or a sister in Christ that you don't, you didn't realize you were going to get burned, but you were. And there's this emotional doubt that's going on. If God's going to allow ha- that to happen through his people, then how can I trust that, right? Uh, so maybe that's where you are. But then there's a third type of doubt that I think is a little harder to describe, but it's a a rebellious doubt. Uh, That rebellious doubt would be kind of like this. You know, following Jesus may get in the way of what I want. So you kind of understand it. You you understand the logic of it. You even understand uh, that emotions, can you can ride the waves of these things. But you're not sure if you want to go all in, so you doubt the whole process, and you doubt that you're going to be covered in the whole process. And, And it's tough. It's tough to be there in your life because now you're living in a compartmentalizing Jesus state of your life and you don't necessarily want to do that. So you doubt that you, the, whole, the whole thing. The, the father with the demon-possessed son, that, that guy in Mark 9, we read about him, that, that was an intellectual doubt. Nobody's healed him yet. We've tried it all. It doesn't make sense to trust in a miracle. 
Okay, that's an intellectual doubt. Thomas struggling with that as well. People don't raise from the dead. The account that we're going to read today in Matthew 11, this doubt is emotional. And and this is where I want to see if you can plant yourself there. Maybe you've had these thoughts there before. It's an emotion. He felt abandoned by God. He felt like God wasn't there when he needed him. And maybe you've been there. And I think you'd be surprised with who we're talking about once we get there. But but think about it this way. Maybe maybe a close friend has completely um, betrayed you. Or a loved one has betrayed you or left you. Maybe uh, a family member has died and there's been some emotional baggage that's going on with that that's where i was the first time in my life that i really remember questioning god maybe you didn't get the job or the house that you wanted and and you thought that things were going to go your way so there's some emotions uh, tied to it maybe you weren't accepted into that school uh, so you think back like oh that was a rough patch in my life maybe uh the financial stress the emotional stress of relationships all these things kind of stack up. At times like these, it feels like, maybe it just feels like God's not there. Maybe it, didn't, maybe it feels like God doesn't have your back. And maybe it feels like there's not an emotional attachment to God in that. That's when you naturally question. That's when the giants of the faith question as well, guys. So, and then there's also, uh, whenever one of your church friends tell you something like this, it's like, hey, God answered a prayer this morning. I was feeling down. Things weren't going my way. And then my sweet husband brought me that Starbucks and everything was okay. And you're like, don't give me that. Don't give me that because that's not the way God works. So you're like, I, you, you doubt the whole thing. Like, if he blessed you, then I'm sure that something's not right. No, I don't know. I don't know where you are emotionally with this. But sometimes you just, it, you, you have these doubts because of the emotional attachment that's coming along here. Matthew 11 includes this account of John the Baptist. I don't know what you know about John the Baptist, uh, but John the Baptist, uh, essentially he paved the way for Jesus as the Messiah, right? Um, that, that's who he was. Uh, he was. He was instilled on this earth with that purpose. That's who he was going to be. Um, just a quick refresher. Jesus, John are cousins. Um, and and <laughs> to, to the point of, listen, John knew who Jesus was while he was in his mother's womb. Mary, uh, the mother of Jesus, while she's pregnant, they walk into a room, and then uh, John's mother uh, feels a leaping inside. I mean, that's what kind of connection there was already between these cousins. And, and John, uh, again, they grew up knowing that I'm going to pave the way for this cousin of mine. And, and this is up to the point where eventually they're, they're across the path. Jesus lives 30 years of his life, and... Uh, all of a sudden, John the Baptist, as he's in the, you know, in the thick of things, trying to do ministry, and Jesus hadn't really quite started yet, John points out and understands the time he's right and says, Behold, the Lamb of God. That's him. This is who we're preparing this for. He is paving the way for Jesus. So you, you understand that there is an emotional connection to Jesus as a person, but also as a divine human as well. And this is, this is what we're... Hey, Jesus, John, to a point, he had a lot of disciples. He had people following him, great following. And he started to encourage his followers, hey, it's time for you to follow him. And so there, there's a lot there riding on this relationship. But Matthew 11, 1 kind of sets this scenario up, this account. It says, when Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, again, this is where we find Jesus all the time. He's teaching, he's preaching, this time specifically with his disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in their cities. So he said, we're going to go out to the bigger crowds now. And this is where things start to change. And, and to my knowledge, it's one of the first times we, that we see a persecution for someone's faith in the Bible. Uh, that This is where we start to see this. Um, we, we find John the Baptist in prison now. Look at verse 2. It says, now when John heard in prison, so he's in prison, and he heard about the deeds of Christ, He sent word by his disciples, and he said to them, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? So you hear this right here, and that that doesn't sound like a behold the Lamb of God type comment, right? And and it really doesn't sound like a, hey, I got your back, cuz. I'm I'm going to keep propping you up. This is my job. This is a, I'm in jail. What's going on? How are you out there not doing anything about my situation? That's exactly what's happening here. John is a pretty bold guy. 
Uh, if you've seen or the, just the imagery that comes to life off the pages, I mean, he's wearing uh, camel uh, clothes and we're eating locusts and, and tying burlap or whatever it is. He's just, it seems like he's a mess, but he's bold and he doesn't mind saying anything uh, to anyone. So he would have asked Jesus this himself, but he's in prison, so he has to send word through his followers. Uh, go ask this guy. Are, are you the one? Are you sure? Again, this is a guy who's leaping for Jesus in his mom's womb. Uh, but he's in prison because he confronted with his boldness this Jewish king Herod, right? Uh, if you don't know this story, real quick, here it is. Herod is married to this lady Herodias, which is weird that they have the same names, right? Uh, uh, but that lady actually was his brother's wife first. So John says, this is weird. No, y'all shouldn't be doing this. And he, he calls out the king and his wife. That's a bold move, guys. That's bold. It'd be like you going up to the president, saying what I know you want to say, right? And just saying it to his face. Uh, whatever it is, that's, those are bold moves. You, you can talk about truths and facts all you want, but there is a way to do things. And John did it. John said, you guys are, are living in sin, basically is what he's saying. You shouldn't be doing this. Herodias, the wife, doesn't think this is very funny like we do, and, and it might be for some of us on the outside saying, yeah, preach, John, do it, say it, whatever. But she doesn't think it's funny, so she uses her power and her husband's power to throw John in jail. So that, to me, I, that's where I start to see some persecution for the first time. This guy's standing up for some moral things that are happening within the kingdom of God, right? This is the king of Israel, and he says, no, you shouldn't be doing that. Not many times do you see someone calling out a king like that. Well, he gets persecuted for his morality. And, and John gets left there in prison. He, he's just left there. He finds himself in this prison, no prospect of getting out, and no real hope of it. So when he does, when he gets left in that situation for as long, he does, as, long as he does, he does what we all do in that situation. He starts to question things. Like, okay, maybe that wasn't a good idea, first off. But where's, where's my cousin <laughs> who's got all this power? Is he going to be able to get me out of here? I've seen him do some things. And Matthew 11 says that while he's in prison, John begins to hear about what Jesus is doing throughout the land, what, what's going on here. And he, it says that he sees the deeds of Jesus. And he knows, he already knows, Jesus is a miracle man, right? He can work miracles. He's doing miracles for everyone. But John... <laughs> So, so he's starting to question here a little bit. I, I don't know if you've ever felt like that. Like, God, you're doing something for him and her and them. And, and here I am over here trying to live my good life. What are you going to do for me? Anybody ever felt like that? Like, wh what's in it for me? And we get a little selfish. That's fine. I, I get it. And it's not great. But there's a reality to it, right? Because that person, they may not have done anything, yet God continues to bless. This is what John is seeing. And, and and God is blessing everyone around but him. And it's a little easier to believe in Jesus, the miracle worker, when you're the recipient of some of those miracles, right? That's what John's saying. It can be easy to feel that way after everything you've done for God. But John still knows, knows that he's the one, knows that Jesus is the Messiah. So he sends word to Jesus, and he just kind of confirming, if I got it, this is my call from prison or whatever. I don't know what he's doing. And he says, are you the one, or is there another one that is to come? So he's kind of on edge here, and you're wondering, why is he asking this thing? Well, he's in prison. He's facing death. He's looking for that miracle his way. How do I get out of here? Why are you letting this happen to me? And the question may be asked, did God love John the Baptist? Well, yeah, he loved John the Baptist. Absolutely he did. He was a part of his master plan. Did, did he think highly of John? Of course he did. How, how do we know that? I'm not just using this by opinion. Jesus actually tells his disciples of, of what he thought, what God thinks of John the Baptist. Look at verse 11. Skip a few verses. We'll go back through here in a minute. But it says, Jesus says, Truly I say to you, among those born of women, in my knowledge that's everybody, right? Anybody born of the woman. Uh, in other words, he's not like a clone of anybody. Uh, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. So what does God think about John? This is a great man. No one greater. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So there's a little bit of humility 
propping as well. That's what Jesus wants to see, everybody. I don't think he's calling out John. I, I think he's just recognizing an opportunity to talk to his disciples. It's not a great race. It's not like we're trying to become the greatest. You become humble. You continue to be great just like John. That, this is what Jesus thinks about him. But John doesn't quite know that Jesus thinks this about him. He, he's not hearing that. He's talking to his disciples about this. And, and, and this is why John doesn't know this. Look at verse 12. It says, this is because this is what's actually happening. It says, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence. So John is experiencing this in his life. I've started this ministry, and now look at all this backlash. Everywhere I go, maybe because it lines up with the introduction of the Messiah, the actual Messiah in their world, in our world. And, and there is a lot of backlash. Just like today, if you are going out in our world today with the, the greatest news of mankind, it's not always going to be received very well. What are you talking about you have the best news in all the world? We got these social programs. Oh, sure, yeah. Uh, this is what we're going to prop up, and we're going to forget the Savior of eternity, right? Uh, th this, is, this is the way it worked then, just like it works now. Not always the best news is received as the best news. Uh, we, we can have the wool pulled over our eyes a little bit. That's, that's what their culture was dealing with. That's what we deal with as well. And Jesus says, hey, this is why it's come like this, because he brings truth and a lot of backlash follows it. And the truth is, Jesus probably didn't have to say this to make it, I mean, because it's not really making himself look too good, because the kingdom of hef, heaven is suffering. But he's, he's saying, uh, this is what's going on here. So what does Jesus do about it? How does he respond to John's request, uh, or his question, I should say? Uh, does he visit him? Does, does he go and say, all right, hey, we're going to figure out an Ocean's Eleven plot to break you out of here? I don't think that's what's going on. Does he write him? Not really. He kind of sends word back to him. Uh, does he appeal on his behalf and say, Judge, I think that there's something, this guy's been wrong. Done. No, none of this happens. Jesus finishes his thought on that last comment. Again, it says, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence. And it says, and the violent take it by force. Talking about the current situation, the current reality. It's a hard world to live in. And then it says, for all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. Basically, what Jesus is saying is, this was all part of the plan. Now, that's tough to hear. Uh, if you're even his disciples and say, whoa, that could be us. We could be the ones sitting in prison. And Jesus is going to sit over here uh, on, his, on his seat saying, hey, it's part of the plan. Man, that, that's a tough thing to hear. But that's exactly what's happening. Jesus said this was prophesied. So John the Baptist is deserted in this dungeon. And, and Jesus is out at the lake, or so it seems to John the Baptist. Like, hey, yeah, you just enjoy your time. Um, this is what it feels like for John or, or for any follower of Jesus. Like, wait. What's going on here? Is this really my job? John's been in prison uh, for a year, maybe a year and a half at this point. This, this is kind of the way the timeline works. And he hears all these rumors about what Jesus is doing, and he asks to make sure, are you sure you're the one? Are, are you the one? And what does Jesus do? He just sends word to John. He doesn't fix it. Uh, th this, is, this is what we need to see from this account in our lives today. It's all about a little bit of a perspective change. Where do you see Jesus and his plan? What does Jesus, what, what Jesus does here is help us see things differently. And, and I think this is one of the hardest parts of doubt. Because here we are as the sun and everything revolves around us. When in reality, the sun, Jesus, we are all revolving around him. And, and we got to change our perspective. This is exactly what Jesus is calling out here. Look at verse 4. Jesus, again, going back to what we were talking about what, when, when John reached out to Jesus. But Jesus answers him, go and tell John what you hear and what you see. Go tell him what's going on. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf are, uh, begin to hear. And the dead are raised up. So they've seen all this stuff. Jesus is listing out the things that are happening. He is this miracle man, right? And the poor have good news preached to them. Tell them all the things that I'm doing for everyone else. The thing is, John knows all this already. Remember, it, he heard of the deeds. He heard all this. He, he had heard this, uh, and, and he prompted the question. So John is really asking for an interpretation here. That's what's going on. Look, it, it, 
Jesus is saying, I need you to look outside the immediate context. I know that your current reality is not pretty. But I want you to know what bigger thing is happening around you. That all these things, people are being healed, the blind are, are seeing, that whether that's a spiritual or a figurative comment, that is a huge thing that's happening for people. They, they were hurting people, they're not hurting anymore. They were poor people, and they're talking about how the kingdom of heaven is going to bless them. All these things that are happening are good things. See outside of your current reality. I know it's tough to be going through this illness. I know it's tough to lose your job. I know it's tough to lose your spouse or whatever it is you fill in the blank and I, I get it i've been there i know it's tough to lose a loved one or to see them struggle god jesus is saying we got to see outside of our immediate context and see something bigger this is for this group of people right here you guys coming to be encouraged i know this is a tough one it's not like a big encouraging uh you know message right but this is where you guys buckle in and say all right I get it, and I know it's bigger than me. This is what John the Baptist was hearing from Jesus. It's bigger than you. Don't let your faith get swallowed up in your immediate surroundings. Don't let it happen. Here's why this is important. It's the same thing for us. When you're in the dungeon, wondering where Jesus is, the reality is Jesus still loves you. And he's always going to love you. Jesus can know exactly where you are, exactly what you're going through, and not love you any less, and not really be any less active in your life. It may seem like it, but it's something bigger than ourselves. He did it for John the Baptist, who was, by Jesus' own words, the greatest human on the planet. And I'm sure that we're not there, right? If he did it for him, if that's the, the situation he left him in, we're going to be left in these situations as well. That doesn't mean he doesn't love us. And Jesus didn't tell John that he was bad for having these moments of doubt. That's the encouraging thing. He was just reminded, hey, this is bigger than you. Remember, we're in this together. It's bigger than me. So when I have my doubts, it's bigger than me. Get on board, Ryan. And it's a tough little kick in the pants. Say, come on, I need you for this. And Jesus gives us this little nugget for his perspective. I like this. In verse 6, he says, blessed is the one who is not offended by me. By all the good things I'm doing for everyone else, don't be offended by that. By all the good things that are going to happen to bad people in our world, don't be offended by that. You are on track and you stay on track because of your faith. Don't be offended by that. Jesus acknowledges this activity or lack of activity for, for us in our lives. This has the potential to sometimes undermine our faith. And he says, don't be offended by it. Stay on with me. And if this is the man... This God is who we follow, and we say, I'm going to die to self and do this. It has to look consistent in all areas of life. And this is the, one of the toughest things, the toughest thing that, to preach to people who might be hurting. But I want you to know I've hurt as well. And I know that if you're hurting right now, there have been great people who have hurt as well. And great people who have questioned God as well. Where are you? But Jesus says, you know what? Just understand this. You are blessed when you don't interpret my silence as absence. I may be silent on the matter, but I'm not absent. Absent. And that's what we need to know in our lives, guys, is that we're not to interpret silence as absence. So if you felt there before, let's look back to the story, to the account of John. Your heavenly Father knows all about you just as he knew all about John. This wasn't the only time that you see an emotional doubt. We, you see this uh, in John chapter 11 when, when Lazarus is dying, right? And his sisters say, hey, Lord, the one you love, your friend, the, the, your, one of your best friends, he's sick and he's dying. And Jesus, what, what does the text say about him? He stayed where he was for two more days. And that's hurtful a little bit, right? But Jesus loved him. And you need to understand that Jesus was going to be glorified through his situation. Don't interpret silence for absence. Your unanswered prayers are not an indictment on God. It doesn't mean that God is uninterested. Just because he unanswers them doesn't, doesn't mean he's uninterested. It's not just your story, but it's the story of others as well. And how can God be seen through our situation right now? This is a big challenge for us. Blessed is he who doesn't lose his faith. 
when things like this happen. There, there's an author, Nancy Guthrie, she says this, and I think this is pretty strong and powerful. She says, trust in God when the miracle does not come, when the urgent prayer gets no answer, when there's only darkness, this is the kind of faith that God values, perhaps most of all. Church, doubts will come. Tough times will come. Where is your faith and where is your perspective? Let's pray. God, thank you again for the promise of who you are through the person of Jesus. We see this consistent. And, and it is encouraging to see a guy last week uh, that may have been a very common person in our lives, just a, a regular person bringing their son uh, to, to be healed. And then to see a person like John the Baptist in his situation not get the attention that was needed God, challenge our perspective right now. We let, allow us to be moldable right now. To take a step forward in you, to strengthen our faith, to say, it's not about me, it's all about you. God, we must become less so that you must become greater. Allow our perspective to be, to be changed, to be overhauled. Whatever the situation is needed for each one of our individual lives, God, do your work. We thank you for being interested in us, even in the lack of answers. It's in your name we pray. Amen.